Hey everybody, Final Thoughts time for Manchu Kuo. And before I get to that, please remember, this was a paid preview. So you should take any subjective opinions I have or my wife has with a grain of salt, because we were paid to do this for the game, which is on Kickstarter right now. And with that out of the way, folks, I gotta say, Jen and I were both really super impressed by this game. And in fact, I'm reminded uh, that just last month, I did an update to my top 10 worker placement games of all time. And... Uh, one of the things I talked about there was a, a very interesting design uh, philosophy that I've seen in a few different games, worker placement games, where there's this concept of the function of workers changes over the course of the game. It evolves um, you know, by going through phases. And that is what makes Manchukuo so special. This uh, fact that, well, on the surface, this is really simple. Okay, I've got some workers. I want to send them out to the village to collect resources so I can convert those resources into points by doing good. Good deeds. Um, you know, just that that's nothing new. You've seen that in a lot of games. But there is so much extra stuff going on. One, and like I said, the most important thing is that's what you do during the day. At night, while you are in this occupied country for by by a, a foreign uh, army that you have to stay away from. All of your pupils come back, and now you use them for a completely different function, this kind of training mini-game where you are trying to upgrade your disciples to reach master status so that you can get bigger, stronger, more powerful combos that you can do in subsequent turns. Uh, because, yeah, um, you know, getting the right pupils to train your right uh, disciples can be a big part of the game. And that's where this area control thing comes in, where if multiple players go to do the same action, whoever sent the most students will get the new pupils to recruit to come back, and those might be the pupils you need desperately to train your um oh your, your disciples. That in of itself, right there, is such a cool idea and just fundamentally flips the script on what you think of as traditional worker placement. That would have been enough to make Manchukuo a special worker placement game in my mind. But that's just where the game starts. Um, on top of that, you have the notion of workers are good at different things. Because your workers are either strong, swift, clever, or wise. And that has different implications depending on how you use them on the board. Although, uh, they, it wouldn't matter at all how you use them on the board if it weren't for the fact that because we are an occupied nation, um, you know, this is, uh, if you didn't watch the video, uh, World War II era China being occupied by Japan, and we're just trying to do right uh, while staying away from the, uh, the Japanese patrols, you have to deal with restrictions that are placed on your workers. Interrogation, uh, segregation, escorting, escorts, um, or you know, coercion, quarantining, harassment, and warrants issued for the arrest of your pupils suddenly, depending on what restrictions you are laboring under, the types of pupils you need to send out, uh, the needs you have to be able to do your tasks during the day could change radically. And so while you're trying to balance that with the need to recruit the correct pupils to um, you know, train your new disciples, but also just trying to get the right resources to rebuild your village or to help the people or to make donations to the... Uh, to the temple to get the all-powerful wise pupils who are wild cards who can do anything. There is just so much going on in this game. I am flabbergasted. It is something very, very special. Um, and you know, Jen and I, I am uh, Jen. Uh, the first time we played it, Jen had to get up and do something, and she did not want to go. She did not want to be torn away because this game is all about you know going for like a really big, long in-game goal by you know scoring 17 points in one in one turn, but it might take you the whole game to get the resources, the offerings you need to get that at the end of the game. Or you're just, um, you know, not getting many points, but grabbing lots of special powers that can help you situationally. Or you're just trying to help people and kind of going in between. You're focusing on your own internal. Oh, and I totally forgot the other thing that's amazing about this game. It's pretty much an unwritten law for the vast majority of worker placement games that bigger is always better. You want a bigger, stronger workforce. More workers equals more stuff means you're better shot at winning. Not so here. Um, for two reasons. One, well, there's the Agricola concept of having to feed your people, which I know some people are going to be put off by, but don't worry. It's really not that onerous here. That's not really the reason you want to hold off on getting a really big 
school full of students that will let you do a million things. Yeah, you have to feed them, but you know what? If you can't feed them, that's okay. You just create more suspicion. And every four suspicion you get, you get another restriction. But if you've got so many students, you have tons of variety and options, it's okay. You can probably work around these restrictions because you have that flexibility with your huge student force that you can send out. The more important thing is, um, well, you know, then the food is the more students you have, the louder they are at night during your clandestine training sessions, and again, the more suspicion you raise. Because if you a, a couple of suspicion, or, or I'm sorry, a couple of restriction cards. It's not going to be that much of a hardship, but the more you get, they start compounding in terms of how they limit you, and more importantly, losing points at the end of the game. The more under the watchful eye of your occupiers you are, the less points you can score. So, you don't want a huge army of students, as much as that would benefit you. Because you'd be able to do better training, you'd be able to do anything you need to do in the village, you will get so under the watchful eye of the, you know, the, the, the local constabulary, it will really slow you down. So, it is, while that's a viable way to go, and it creates a bunch of interesting um, uh, considerations, you can go the complete opposite way. Strip it down. Use four um, students to go do an action, and then only get one student in return, and next thing you know, you'll have the tiniest, most select school in town. And that means, if you only have a few students, instead of earning more students, you are drowning in wisdom. Because with only a few students, it's much easier to teach them. It's much easier to share lessons, and next thing you know, you've got so much wisdom. And this wisdom is an incredibly powerful wild card of its own. It allows you to avoid the patrols, so you'd have less suspicion. It allows you to supplement. Um, you could send out three regular pupils, or one pupil with two extra wisdom to do the same amount of work. So, you're, um, you're avoiding all the problems of having a really big school, but you're giving up a lot of your flexibility. Um, you're staying hidden from, the, uh, from your occupiers, but um, you can't train as well. Um, because wisdom will not help your disciples. Because your disciples, they're already past wisdom. They're one step away from master. I love how thematic everything is here. Everything makes sense when you think of it in terms of these students trying to do good by day, trying to train by night. They're almost like, you know, um, ancient China's version of a whole group of Batman trying to, you know, uh, get ready for, you know, mild-mannered by day, um, you know, vigilantes by night. And, um, and I gotta say another thing. Jen wanted me to mention this. She so loves a game. And it's surprising how often, how or rarely I should say, we get a game like this where the verb, the fundamental verb that defines what you do in this game is help. It's not kill, like a lot of board games. It's not build, like a lot of Euros. Instead, it is help. Um, help the people, help the village, help the temple, help your disciples. Everything about this game is trying to improve the lives of others. And Jen, and I should say me too, we both loved this theme. Uh, it is so evocative, and if all that weren't enough, it actually tells a very interesting um, chapter of uh, human history that, well, being um, you know a, a product of the West, I'm not generally exposed to. I don't really know anything about the Japanese occupation of China during World War II. And um, it's so wonderful that this game kind of opens a window and shines a light onto that period and that place. And... Um, it creates a really wonderful, fresh, incredibly inventive, just really outside of the box worker placement game. At the same time, I am just flabbergasted how much this game does so well. And uh, yeah, Jen and I, we have really enjoyed our time with it. Um, I mean, if I were to complain, really, my complaints at this point have to do more with there's a line, uh, you know, there's like a page devoted to the history. Uh, of the Japanese occupation and you know how what we're doing kind of uh, mimics what was really happening at the time and all that um, and then it just says we uh, it was a, it's a fascinating moment of history we recommend you read more about it and I'm like well tell me what to read give me some give me a bibliography so I can actually go off because I'm curious about this yeah I can just go read the Wikipedia entry but I mean developers you, you've got my attention. Use that to your advantage. Give me some suggested reading. I mean, um, you know, uh, that's the kind of stuff I have to nitpick about this game because the core gameplay here is so sharp. I guess if I if I were to nitpick about gameplay, one thing I'm really surprised by is you always set up um, all these areas of the village in the exact same place every time. The um, you know the repair section is right next to the family, is right next to the bank every single time you play. And I'm really kind of surprised 
very surprised that they don't say, hey, this is like the, the suggested first few times you play, but after that, mix them up. Randomize them. So that the bank might be right next to the temple. And that means when somebody goes to the bank, oh, it's cutting off the temple. I don't understand why there's not a... I mean, may, there's probably a good reason for it, but that seems like a missed opportunity. Also, I will say that while Jen and I have enjoyed it very much as a two-player game, for the first half of the game, it is pretty easy with only two players because there's no scaling on the board at all. That's kind of a bummer. Um, the first half of the game, it's pretty easy to avoid any real restrictions. But later on in the game, when we're running out of time and we're both trying to do the same stuff, we might you know, bump into each other more. Or if we have more um, restrictions on us, I suspect, I've only played as a two-player game, but I suspect if you play at the higher player counts, it's going to be, those first few rounds are going to be much more interesting and tension-filled because there's more players going to more places. And I kind of wish that there had been something done in the two-player design. Don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining. We've had a great time as a two-player game. The tension really ratchets up at the at the end. But then I find, man, why wasn't that tension there from the get-go? Um, you know, why weren't there, you know, uh, dungeon pets. You know, the notion of, oh, there's just a, a third character, uh, you know, a, a dummy player who all you have to do is say, just have some additional students that are always in the tiger space and every round, you know, they just move clockwise one. You know, so they're always moving and it just creates the element of another player so that the majority, the area majorities for different areas becomes a little bit more interesting. Like I said, it definitely rises in importance as the two-player game goes on, but I'd like to see import right from the get-go. And a really simple trick, like Vlada Fischoadl's Dungeon Pets, it, you know, for players who hate dummy players, don't worry, it'd be so simple. It's just like, oh, um, at the beginning of every day, you just move them clockwise one space. And that's it. And now, all of a sudden, oh, well, I want to go there, but I'm not going to be able to do the swap because the dummy is going to be able to block that for me. A, a simple little thing like that would have been nice. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it needs it, because, like, Jen and I, we really liked it. But I'm just trying to find a way, you know, to take this game from, uh, from a low 8 to a high 8 on a 10-point scale. Because this game is already super rock solid, and it could be amazeballs with a couple little tweaks like that. But that's, again, minor complaints. We really enjoyed it. Um, Jen wa didn't want me to take this to go set to play because she wanted to play it again immediately. She was having so much fun. Um, I'm very, very impressed by Amanda Kuo and uh, everything it does so well. And like I said, folks, on Kickstarter right now. But again, take what I said with a grain of salt. Yes, I was very uh, positive, uh, very effusive about this game. And if you uh, don't trust my particular opinions, watch the run-through, decide for yourself if it looks like fun. That's what you should always do with my videos. And with that, I will say thank you very much for watching. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.